So my friends, would you please take your Bibles, your devices? Would you travel with me this morning to 1 Peter? I know there's some of you that made your way through these doors without receiving one of these outlines. If, if you need one of these, I would encourage you. Uh, it, hey, we're, we're pretty casual here in, in most senses, uh, I would say. Um, if you want to head to the back and grab one of these, feel free because this will help you follow along with what we're talking about today. There's going to be a lot of words said today, okay? So the intention of this time, this 45 minutes, I know I prayed for, but sometimes it extends into the hour period. Um, but in this time, our prayers that we dig deep, we get into God's word, all right? You can go to any devotional or to go to YouTube and find an encouragement for the day. We want you to find, when you come here, we want you to be fed well because we're digging in. This, this, is, this is going to take some brain power, some thinking cap time, all right? Um, so I hope you're engaged for the next 45 minutes. Obviously, we know that as we read God's holy word, it is going to be, the, the work of the Holy Spirit is going to be alive in us to help us understand the truths of the scriptures. So in this time, I hope you're ready to dig in. If you're new with us, we are on this journey through the book of 1 Peter. What a wonderful book. If you want to kind of give the, the way big overview of this, this is a book consumed with God's sustaining grace. He's holding us up through pain, through trials, through uncertainties. He's got his children. He's holding us. This is a book written to a group of believers who were going through intense suffering. And Peter says, this is a God of all grace. He's got you. He's holding you up. That's why I love this book. It's, it's so appropriate for what so many of us in this room are going through. Maybe it doesn't compare exactly with what the first century church was going through, but there's so many similarities. The trials you might be going through physically, the trials you might be going through socially, some sort of social rejection, uh, through pain, even trials you might go and be going through mentally or, or psychologically, even some of those trials you might be going through spiritually right now. You're under attack in a massive way. Friends, this book is for us. We lean heavily into God's sustaining grace. We trust the one who's got us, and that is First Peter. As you can see on the bottom of the, the, the um, notes section, there's a bit of an outline there. Some of you like to follow along with that. You can see on this outline, we've made our way through the introduction. We've made our way through the first major section, God's grace and complete salvation, past, present, future. This is the foundation stone for enduring and persevering through trials. And now we're in this section, God's grace for personal holiness. This section runs from chapter 1, verse 13, all the way to chapter 2, verse 11, with some overlap on both sides. Today we're going to interact with this key truth. As they depend on God's grace for personal holiness through suffering. That's a mouthful. We'll kind of look at that in just a minute. But then this phrase, God's people are to submit as obedient children to their perfect father. All right, that's a lot in a key idea. But if we look at the red part there, that is the theme of the book. So it's basically we're taking the big theme and kind of narrowing it down to this passage. The theme of the book, uh, the theme of the book many would say would be this, depending on God's grace through suffering. Okay. Then you narrow it down a bit to this section, personal holiness. Okay, here's the idea. That as we are persevering by God's grace, we live lives of personal holiness. The word holiness means consecrated. We live consecrated lives for King Jesus and what he says to us. We live lives that match the expectations of God's word. That is the theme of this section. So the broader theme, as they depend on God's grace through suffering, then the theme of this section for personal holiness, 
Now we come even more narrowly to this paragraph of verses that we're in today. This section of verses. And here's the theme that we'll develop today. God's people are to submit as obedient children to their perfect father. To their heavenly father. Suffering saints living in personal holiness like obedient children to a wonderful, gracious, kind, holy Father. I want us to just jump right into the text. Would you follow along? And as we read through this, would you see how Peter designates these personalities in this text? Two major personalities, obedient children, a wonderful Father. All right, let's start. Actually, let's do, let's do a read-in by going to verse 13. This is what we studied last week. Verse 13 says, Therefore, preparing your minds for action. Roll your sleeves up. <laughs> Get ready. Here it goes. Being sober-minded, set your hope fully on the grace that will be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ is coming. Don't ever forget it. Put your eyes on him. Through the suffering, look to Jesus and don't take your eyes off of Jesus. That's verse 13. Now that leads us into our study today. Last week, one verse. This week, here we go, eight verses. Well, let's walk through them. Verse 14. As obedient children, do not be conformed to the passions of your former ignorance. But as he who called you is holy, you also be holy in all your conduct. Since it is written, you shall be holy for I am holy. Leviticus 5. Then verse 17. And if you call on him as father, who judges impartially according to each one's deeds, Conduct yourselves with fear throughout the time of your exile. Verse 18. Knowing this. Knowing that you were ransomed from the futile ways inherited from your forefathers, from your earthly fathers. Not with perishable things such as silver and gold. Verse 19, this good father, what did he do to pay for this? Verse 19 says, but with the precious blood of Christ, like that of a lamb without blemish and spot, he was foreknown before even the foundation of the world, but was made manifest in the last times for the sake of you. You who through him are believers in God. Who raised him from the dead and gave him glory. Why? So that your faith and hope are in God. And who is this God? He is the perfect father. The gracious father. What is this? Well, right away you can see as we've already mentioned... Peter is setting up this very helpful analogy as we walk in newness of life, as we live in holiness. Remember, you have a good father. You are a child of a good father. And as a child of this good father, you are to be obedient to this good father. So we're clear when we talk of this, this key truth that involves personal holiness. Personal holiness is not based on your feelings or whatever self-construct you want. It's based on God and God's word. Sure, there's going to be preferences of how we see this lived out, but the primary force of personal holiness is in exactly what God says. His word. Personal holiness, as we talked of last week, is living a life set apart. That's at the base of this word, holiness. The word means to be consecrated. This is a word that means to be, in a sense, distinct. 
distinct from who you once were before Jesus. Going from a life that was consumed with me and everything I want in this world to a life consecrated to God, his glory, and what he wants for my life. That is living in personal holiness. We've already talked about this, especially through our study in the book of Romans. All right. Holiness does not come because I really work hard at it. This is what's called positional holiness. When we come to Jesus Christ in faith, he declares us righteous, okay? You cannot make yourself holy before God. When you stand before God, you stand condemned on your own. What do you need for holiness? You need faith in what Jesus did on the cross. He did the work. This is called positional holiness or what's called justification. But then the story of the New Testament is now act like who you've been made. You have been made holy, so now over here, walk in holiness. Live in holiness. Not only experience positional justification, the theological term, being declared righteous, now walk this way. This is called progressive sanctification. He is making you and I more and more holy every day through choices not to do this and to obey God. Personal holiness is when God says in his word, don't do this, guess what? We don't do it. (laughs) This is a work of the spirit in our hearts. This is a work of his grace. If God says to do something, I will choose to do something by his grace. This is walking in personal holiness. This is not what the world says. This is not how I feel in the moment. This is what God says I am to do as a follower of Jesus Christ. That is personal holiness. Much more to that story as we'll unpack. But in this section, these verses, 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 14 through 21, Peter now talks about this personal holiness, what this looks like through tough times. When you look at this section, think in your mind, trust me through your pain. Trust God through your pain. Trust the good father. And my mind just sometimes just floods with illustrations, all right, on how this looks in practical life, all right? Many of us in this room are parents. One of the greatest trials of all of life is when your young one gets one of those small pieces of wood stuck underneath their skin. Splinters, all right, slivers. Maybe some of you had this experience this week. I mean, this is life and death for this little child. The pain, the agony, the crying, Some kids handle this better than others. Some of them, honestly, in our family, we have five kids, right? So some of them are like, yeah, extract it. Get this thing out. You got, they're standing there, right? With the, um, uh, you know, the cleaner there. And then you got tweezers there and you got a needle there. And they're just like, pull it out. Other kids, when they get, You know what it's like. They get that sliver and it's like the world falls apart. And they walk into the bathroom, you know, the little mini medical treatment center we have. And you actually just hold the tweezers in your hands and it's like, "Ah!" pain's coming. And constantly what you're doing is this. Hold still. Trust me through the pain. I'm going to help you. Okay. In a sense, I want you to think of this text this way. Hold still. Do what I'm telling you to do. We're extracting the bad stuff out of your life. Trust your dad. Okay? We had this agreement when I was younger. Hannah would deal with uh, poop and pee. I, uh, I would deal with the blood and guts. All right? Um, so I'm a lot of times dealing with the blood and guts and taping things up. She gets all the other fun stuff. I have such an intense gag reflex that it's more of an issue, an event when I have to deal with the backsides and vomits and all that. Too much information, I'm sorry. (laughs) 
And one of the, one of the toughest parts of being a child is not just the, the slivers, but then they graduate to the bike or the dirt bike, the mountain bike. Uh, the, I mean, we're moving on two wheels. Inevitably, when you're on two wheels and your balance is somehow lost, you're gonna hit the ground. It's gonna hurt. You're gonna have rocks and dirt embed themselves in your skin at some point. So now we've gone from this toddler now to this elementary student and you're saying the exact same thing. Hold still. Trust dad. You're pulling out the peroxide and they know. Yeah! And they're holding it together and they're wincing and moving and you're like, hold still. We're going to get that dirt and those rocks out of your knee one at a time. We're going to clean this up. Trust your dad. Okay, I want us to think of this passage in a very similar way. As believers, we're constantly being cleaned up. God is taking that remaining flesh in us, those desires to want to live for the world, to want to lie, to want to just do anything we want with our viewing pleasures. We live in a world that all these moral walls are just crashing. And I want to do that. I mean, sin is clear, or or the Bible's clear. Sin is fun for a season, but the end brings destruction. And we want to do these things. And we're being refined in sanctification. It hurts sometimes. These trials And Peter in this text, I believe, is saying, your life is getting cleaned up by a gracious God. Through your suffering, still be holy. Live in this holiness, but trust a good father. He's got you. He's doing this work of grace in your heart as he's refining your heart. My brothers and sisters in Christ, I believe that's where we're at in 1 Peter chapter 1. Let's unpack this these two personalities, obedient children and the perfect father. Both themes in this text. Let's start with the obedient children part because that's where uh, Peter starts. It's not too hard to identify this because this is, <laughs> this is the, the phrase that starts us into this entire section, as obedient children, all right? Launches us into the discussion here. Um, but this is a good time for a quick pastoral starting point, okay? In the Bible, let's, let's just start with this. I don't want to assume we're all on the same page with this, okay? But in the Bible, in fact, children are expected to obey parents. <laughs> let's, let's start with that. We live in a world that kind of waters that down. I mean, you, you've watched the different stages of parenting and those short videos that come up and differences of parenting back in the day to now and who's negotiating with who. I'm gonna tell you, in the Bible, children obey parents in the Lord for this is right. The scripture says this, okay? If you have any question about that, you can go from the Torah in the Old Testament all the way into the New Testament. I don't know that a text says it more clearly than Ephesians chapter six. Children, obey your parents in the Lord for this is right. And then the fifth of the 10 commandments back in the Torah, honor your father and mother. This is biblical. Now, what we understand is children become not so much children into adults. There's this transition from command to counsel, uh, from from being like uh, from a little kid to a, a big person. You transition from obeying more to an honor type system. We we understand that, but nonetheless, in the scriptures, for young children. It is commanded by God to obey your parents in the Lord. That's a good starting point. 2,000 years after this is written, I don't want to take for granted that there's some questions about that. So Peter jumps into this and says, as obedient children. Now what are these obedient children to do in this text? Well, these are, and this is more of a description here, the next phrase is, Do not be conformed to the passions of your former ignorance. Well, that's a mouthful. Obedient children, what are you not to do? There it is. Do not be conformed to the passions of your former ignorance. Okay, what is this talking about? 
Let's just look at these phrases one at a time. Do not be conformed. Okay, that concept of conformed is not new to the New Testament. We've seen this through Paul's writings. The concept of conformed is kind of like you can, you can actually see it in the word conformed, the word form. It's taking on the form of something. Okay? Some of you are, are into maybe casting or molding. I, I think more probably for a simple mind like mine, uh, probably the better analogy would be what happens around Christmas time when you take this, this cookie cutter and you place it into the dough and it takes on the form of that cookie. <laughs> that's, in my mind thinking, that's what it means to be conformed. You take on, take on a shape. And, and what is Peter saying here? The same as what Paul has said through the Spirit. Don't be conformed to something. What is that something? To the passions of your former ignorance. Some of your Bibles will say the desires. Some of your Bibles will say the lusts. And that's it. It is the lusts, that desire, that drive that you had pre-salvation before you came to Jesus okay let's think about that drive what drove us for every single decision before we came to Christ I'll tell you what drove every decision me whatever pleases me best and you see this as it as it's worked out in all of these areas of life morality Choices of interacting in community. And Peter says, don't take on the form of your BC life. That's before Christ life. You're still going to struggle with these things. Otherwise, I mean, you, you see this all the way through the New Testament. So even though he's redeemed us and changed our hearts, we still have this. <laughs> all right, the flesh. We still struggle with these things. In this struggle, don't take on the form of the life without Christ. A life that's consumed with you. A life that's consumed with only what you want in life. A life that worships you. By the way, how appropriate is that in a world that's consumed with humanism? Everything is about me. What makes me feel good? What best serves my heart in the moment? In this text, Peter says, don't be conformed to your old lusts. But it's not just a don't do something. And by the way, with those lusts, I think a passage that really explains this well, First John 2, John says this, all right? What is this former lust? He, he identifies, identifies it as being the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the pride of life. This is what characterizes our BC days, before Christ days, those drives, First John 2. He says, don't be conformed to your old lust. So that's the don't, but I love this because in the scriptures, it's not full of don't do that and don't do that. And it's not just exclusively don't do this, it's do something. Holiness is not just don't do something, holiness is live this way. And that's exactly what he says here. Don't be conformed to the passions of your former lusts, but be devoted to a new behavior. Child of God, obedient child, live like the family ethics that God wants. You've been brought into the home, now embrace the ethics of King Jesus' family, God's family. This is talking about obedient children who are devoted to a new behavior. Let's just see this behavior. Would you look with me at verse 15? We're following along here. Verse 15. So these obedient children are not to be conformed to the passions of the former lust. But verse 15 says, but as he who called you is holy, you also be holy in all your conduct. Since it is written, you shall be holy for I am holy. Verse 17, and if you call on him as father who judges impartially according to each one's deeds, conduct yourselves with fear through the time of your exile. Okay, what is this? Again, holiness is not just a negative, turning from something. Holiness is a positive, turning to something. This holiness is not just don't do something, it's do something. It's not just refuse something, it's embrace something. Embrace a family dynamic, a family 
behavior system that is in line with the nature of the Father who called you. All right, in these verses, there's two primary imperatives. And by the way, just when you think about Bible studies, one of the best things I think to do in Bible studies is find the primary imperatives in a text. Okay, so we're looking at eight verses here. Okay, what is the brunt? Like, what's the punch of what Peter's saying here? Look at the main commands. There's two main commands. First main command is this, be holy in all your conduct. All right, you're like, well, well, didn't he just say, uh, do not be conformed to the passions of your former ignorance? Isn't that a command? Well, I'll tell you this, in in your Greek studies, you'll find that there's participles that point to the main imperative. That's a participle. It's pointing to the main command. So don't live this way, but here's the main command. Be holy in all your conduct. Live this holy life. Be set apart, consecrated to God with everything you do. Having been made positionally holy, declared righteous before a holy God, now live out practical, progressive holiness with every choice you make. In progressive holiness, we are to be holy with all of our conduct. Not some of what we do. Not most of what we do. Not when we're at church and around Jesus' people. All of our conduct. We're talking about when we're on our phones. We're talking about young ones when you're at school. We're talking about at work. Guess what? We're talking about conduct when you're behind that wheel. That that, that is one of the hardest places for me to live holy and not lose my anger. Driving, I kind of like, especially in Reading sometimes. Uh, I'm about, I almost just went on a rant. I'll refuse. Because God says, be holy as I am holy. So I'm going to not do that. The fact is this. When we come to Jesus, we have a new expectations for life. This is practical holiness. When you, when you look at life, think of it this way. If I am living as an obedient child of God, there are actually places that I will not go to in my life. There are things that I will not participate in. There are things I won't look at. There are actions that obedient child or children will not participate in. There are reactions that obedient children will refuse to embrace. That is the new life. There are addictions that I won't keep doing because I'm a child, an obedient child of this king. This is in the scriptures. So this child of God is to be devoted to new behavior. And in this new behavior, God through his holy word says, be holy in all your conduct. Remember I said there's two primary imperatives in this section. What's the second one? Here we go. Verse 17, conduct yourselves with fear. Okay, that's really cool because what Peter just did is he took the root of this noun in the first uh, imperative and turned it into the verb of the second imperative. The noun is now in, in, in verb form. So don't just be holy in all your conduct. He says, conduct yourself with fear. Ooh, that's a fun one to navigate through as believers. You know, in the Bible, it actually says to fear God. We've we've so watered down this concept of fear. This is what the book of Proverbs says is the beginning of wisdom is a fear of the Lord. But we've also taken these concepts of fear that we have in 2024 and read them back into the text. So when you read into the text, you're going to realize that there's a fear talked about in the Bible that is not simply a cowering fear. A fear like, oh no, here it comes. Ah! It is not a terror. It is not a horror type feel. This type of fear in the scripture is a bowing fear. It is bowing in reverence. It is bowing in awe. 
I am going to reverence this God in all because of his power, his strength, his expectations for my life. That is the fear of the Lord. And what does Peter say here? Conduct yourself with fear. With fear. Conduct yourself. What is this conduct yourself? Behave yourself. Okay? Behave yourself with respect for the Father. Okay, back to the kid thing, all right? On this occasion, maybe you and your family have been invited over to someone's house for dinner. What is the final word of any dad before you open those car doors? Behave. When you get out of this car and when you open that door, behave with respect. Act like you're supposed to act, please. Behave yourself. Okay, this is Peter saying, child of God, behave yourself in everything you do. Behave yourself with respect. And who is the object of this respect? It is God the Father. Act with respect towards your heavenly Father. The clear point here is this, believers, We are to live our lives as obedient children who refuse to be conformed to former lusts, but who embrace lifestyles devoted and consecrated to a new behavior, a new lifestyle. Friends, if I could just speak openly, how how appropriate is that for the community we live in right now? In no way am I standing up here wanting to bash anybody. But but I'm going to say, in in general, this is a very conservative area of the of the state. I'm going to tell you, you run into people all through your day that are going to be like, "Oh yeah, I I prayed this prayer and I baptized in this baptism that baptismal." I haven't gone to church in 25, 30 years. I'm living like however I want. All these addictions in my life. And I'm not standing up here being the judge of what's happening in their hearts. That's God. But I'm going to tell you, the easy thing to do is to check the box. I made this prayer one of these times in my life. I'm good. VBS happened. Camp happened. Check. I'm good. No, friends, that is not the call of the Bible. When you come to Jesus Christ in saving faith, it is a transformation that is to happen in your life. Now, sure, there's ups and downs and all arounds. Sure, there's times in your life, there's some that have come to Jesus Christ in true faith that have never really had that opportunity to grow in a deep way. But I'm going to tell you, if you are a child of God, there will be evidence of new life. At some point along the way, there will be an expression of new life in Christ. Somewhere, somehow. And I love what Peter says here. This new life is to say no to the old flesh, the BC days, and yes to the good Father and His holiness. What makes us be able to, I guess to say this, to be able to to take this? What, What helps us to be able to swallow this call? Be holy for I am holy. How does that work then? You're like, some of you right now are like, nope. Can't do it. Man, guess what, Pastor Andrew? I got to get up on Monday morning. I got to go work with those people. You don't know who I have in my home. (laughs) You don't know the struggles with addictions that I have. Now what helps us with motivation is the next section. Be holy for I am holy. Now we come to Peter saying, here's how this is going to happen. How is this going to happen? Trust the perfect Father. Look to Him and His grace. For the remainder of our time today, I want us to see how Peter describes this perfect Father. This Father who, in a sense, is extracting these slivers and cleaning out this road rash. This Father who is walking with with us all along the way, saying, Listen to me, obey me. Do what I'm telling you to do. This good father. How is this father described in this text? Well, even before we get there, what about this terminology, father? 
Where would Peter have picked up on this? How do we know, and and this is very clear in the scriptures, that God wants to be known as our Father. An endearing term, a relational term. How do we know this? Well, I'll tell you, probably in your mind right now is what's called the Lord's Prayer, right? Who would have heard Jesus' first rendering on the Sermon on the Mount on how to pray? Peter would have. Can you imagine being shocked when you're there with Peter and Jesus is saying, pray like this. Here's how you pray. Our Father. Peter, I mean, my, I'm, I'm like 99.9% sure when Jesus was praying, they weren't all bowing their heads and closing their eyes. <laughs> Peter looking at Jesus like, our Father? Yes, this is how you are to pray. Address this God as your Father. He loves you. He cares for you. By the way, that's in Matthew chapter 6, verse 9, if you're wondering. Pray then like this, our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Remember that? All right, let's see how this Father is described by Peter through the Spirit. All right? Four reasons to know that this is a perfect Father. Four expressions, four descriptions, and we've already sort of interacted with one. This Father is perfect. Perfectly holy. Verse 15. But as he who has called you is holy, so also you also be holy in all your conduct. Since it is written, you shall be holy for I am holy. Again, that is written in Leviticus chapter 11, verse 44. Okay, in the next couple minutes, we will barely scratch the surface to this Mount Everest discussion on God's holiness. You could preach in this pulpit for year after year on that one subject, and you would never, never fathom the depths of what the holiness of God means. This is a big deal. Book after book, I mean, some of the books you interact with barely scratch the surface. Others take you a little bit deeper into this concept of God's holiness. To say that our heavenly father is holy is to say that this father is completely separate from sin. But it's not that he's completely just separate from sin. He is completely separated to his own standard of righteousness. That is this God. This God has a nature that is completely molded to absolute moral perfection. There is not one shred of sin in this God. There is every expression of moral uprightness in this God. This is why, as we sang a little bit earlier, this is why the seraphim in Isaiah chapter six, by the way, if you want to wake up call to the holiness of God, I have to go there regularly. Isaiah chapter six. And when Isaiah is confronted with the holiness of God, breaks him to pieces. In Isaiah chapter six, the seraphim who covered their faces and one called to the other, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. In the Hebrew language, the way to not just emphasize a concept, if you want to emphasize a concept, say it twice. If you want to make this a superlative concept, say it three times. Holy, holy, holy. One of my favorite authors that deals, I believe, very insightfully into this is a guy by the name of R.C. Sproul. The Holiness of God. Read his book on holiness. He points out in this concept that of all of these attributes of God, it is pointed out the holiness of God. Not love, love, love. Not has said, has said, has said. Not power, power, power. But holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. Friends, when we interact with the holiness of God, it blows our minds. 
this God demands, or this God shows us holiness and demands this holiness. We must remember that we cannot deconstruct God's nature. Okay, so that's one of our ways of dealing with his attributes, his perfections. It's kind of be like, he's part this, he's part this, he's part this. And we cannot compartmentalize this God. He is all of who he is. But I will say this, when you look at the holiness of God through the scriptures, this seems to be the primary attribute from which all other attributes of this God flow. He is holy. He's distinct in and of himself, completely free from all that is sin and completely free to all that is righteous. That is this God. We must remember that this is a God who has brought us into relationship with him. Friends, you cannot touch the holiness of God on your own. The only way to interact with the holiness of God is through the perfect God-man, Jesus Christ. The one who went to the cross so that now we could be declared holy in his sight. We now take on the robes of Christ's righteousness. So now when we look at this holy God, it's not a fear of being pounded. It is a fear of reverence and awe that he has brought us into the family. That God adopted me? Really? And what is Peter saying in this text? Friends, as obedient children, remember that that holy God, he brought you into the family. He adopted you into his holy family. What's the natural outcome of how this works? Okay, so if the Holy Father brought you into this holy family, then guess how you ought to live on Monday morning and on Monday night after work and through the entire day. Live for this holy God, this holy Father. Again, scratching the surface and we're going to keep moving through this. There's another description of this perfect father and we find this in verse 17. I love this description. Verse 17, this God who judges impartially according to each one's deeds. (laughs) Okay, one of the hardest tasks of any father is to be fair. We have five kids. Young adults is all the way down to six now, all right? I'm going to tell you, that is a task. To be completely fair with each one of them. To deal with each one of them in, in a way that says, you're not more important than this one. Okay, I love this one longer because they've been on this earth longer. But I love you all the same. I'm going to treat you all fair. That is so hard. And I love how Peter says this. Is this God not only is perfectly holy, but every one of the people that are his, he treats with absolute fairness. Everyone in the family, he treats fairly. This is so important because who is Peter writing to? He's writing to a bunch of Gentiles. And in their minds, they might be thinking, oh, we're just subpar. Oh, man. <laughs> You know, we've been brought to the party late. You know, we don't even get to come and hang out and do everything that the Jews did, right? In in biblical history. You know what Peter is saying? No, 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 no. You've been brought to the family. He's impartial. This God does not have respect of persons. It's not about you. It's about his glory. And friends, how do you then live that out as a child of God? Oh, this is so good because we don't live in this world of I'm going to do my best to show God that I love him more than the person sitting across the room from me. I'm better. You know what the impartiality of God does? It breaks down walls of arrogance in the body of Christ. He loves us all. We are all his children. And that's exactly what Peter's saying in context. This God is holy. This God is impartial. Whether you've been in his family for one week or whether you've been in his family for 81 years, he's impartial. He loves you. 
This father is a perfect father. How else is this perfect father described? He's gracious. Well, you're like, okay, he's already said that. But look at how he explains his grace in this text. Okay, back to the, the earthly father thing, okay? I mentioned this in our prayer group. Uh, we come to church on Sunday mornings and my daughter Emma is engaged in going to church and probably the primary way is because what Jim and Diane have set up so beautifully and all those workers out there, dad, I need a dollar and a quarter to buy my donut. I'm going to be a good dad, you know. Go scrounge up some quarters. Here you go. Go get your donut. And that's my gift for the day, you know. It's like I was, did my fatherly thing. My wife is so good about helping out our kids. I'm a little more stingy. Um, she helps them buy all their clothes for school. I don't have to do all that. If, if I were men, ooh, my poor kids. <laughs> all right. You're going to wear those shoes whether they're four sizes too big for you or not. All right, you need two more holes in that pair of shoes. All right, it is tough to be a good dad when it comes to giving gracious gifts to your kids. And I love how Peter says this because he steps this thing up massively. What has this gracious father done? Let's read about it in verse, six, uh, verse 18. Knowing that you were ransomed, okay, you were redeemed, you were bought, you were brought into the family. How? Or from what? From the feudal ways inherited from your earthly fathers. Okay, your earthly fathers passed on one thing to you. That's sin. They're kind, they're good, but they passed on sin. What did the perfect father do to deal with that sin? We find this explained. Knowing that you were ransomed from the futile ways inherited from your forefathers, not with perishable things like silver and gold, but with the precious blood of Christ. Like that of a lamb without blemish and without spot. What is the priceless treasure that God, this good father, gave that we might be brought into his family? Our perfect, as it were, older brother, Jesus the Son of God, heirs together with King Jesus. Jesus went to the cross and shed his perfect blood that you might be brought into the family. Oh, friends, you couldn't pay an amount of gold or silver to make that happen. The most valuable commodities on the face of the earth, potentially, gold and silver, don't touch the precious blood of the Son of God who went to the cross to bring us into his family. Okay, let's bring this down to earth now. Peter is saying, live as obedient children. Why? Because of the price that God paid to bring you into the family. The precious blood of Christ as of a lamb without blemish, without spot. That takes us all into the Old Testament. What was required for the covering of sin, it was a perfect lamb. Jesus is the perfect of the perfect. The holy lamb of God. So much more we could say of this, but I want us to go to the last description, I believe, in this description of Peter for this wonderful, perfect father. He is sovereign. Okay, he's over all. Not a single dad... In the history of ever, will ever compare to God, our Father, our Heavenly Father. And how does he describe this? He describes this by showing that this holy, impartial, gracious God has power over all time and space. What dad can do that? Oh boy, I wish I had power over time and space. No, I don't really, but it's fun to dream that way. All right, get kids to school on time every day. Um, time and space are things we can't touch. They happen. And there's another area that's called life and death. What dad can stop the death of his child? There's been some in this room who've lost children. You can't stop these things. But there's a father who's ordained all things 
according to his glory and our good somehow. And Peter describes this. How how does he describe this sovereignty of this good father? He says this, verse 20, he, referring to Christ, was foreknown before the foundation of the world. Okay, it breaks time barriers. You weren't even around when this father had this plan put together. And you were part of this plan. So Christ was foreknown before the foundation of the world, but was manifest in the last times for the sake of you, his children. Who's the you? It is his children, his obedient children. Verse 21, who through him are believers in God, who raised him from the dead and gave him glory. Oh, okay, there's the other element that you can't touch, dad. I can't touch. I can try to fix up the knee on my kid and take out a splinter. I can't give them new life. That's God. This father can. And what is the purpose statement here? There's two purpose statements and you've probably already identified them. We've already read the one, the first purpose statement. For the sake of you, his children. He's got a wonderful plan, friend, for you. If you've come to him in saving faith, if you are part of his family, oh, hold on to this with all you got. Through the pain of trials of this life, through the messed up world we live in with sin, he's got you. He's doing this for your sake, holding you by his grace. And the last one, so that your faith and hope are in God, in him, the good father. This God, this father is holy. This God is impartial. This God is gracious. This God is sovereign. And he's brought us into his wonderful family. And so we go right back to the two imperatives. Be holy in all your conduct. You've been brought into this home, so be holy. Conduct yourself in reverence and awe to this father. So what? This question, as you, my friend, persevere by God's grace, one day at a time. As you deal with addictions, as you deal with pain, as you deal with suffering, The question is this, are you living as an obedient child to a perfect father? Brothers and sisters in Christ, are you right now honoring your heavenly father by your choices? We must acknowledge first and foremost that these choices start with a changed heart. You won't, again, it's back to that free will discussion. God's given us a, a, a volitional will, but it's set wrong. It's set towards what I want until God regenerates my heart. Friend, has God changed your heart? Have you put your faith and trust in Jesus Christ? You can talk about the family all you want. But until you place your faith and trust in Jesus Christ, you're not in the family. You're an outsider looking in, wanting to potentially be in the family, but really wanting what you want more than what God the Father wants. Have you placed your faith and trust in Jesus Christ? If not, my friend, would today be the day? But then for those of us who have come to him in saving faith, do you trust the Father's program is best? Do you trust that those tweezers and that needle are gonna work for your good? It's gonna hurt for a while, but it's for your good. This program includes you. You've been brought into his family, friend. Oh, brothers and sisters in Christ. I mean, this this is so much more meaningful, I believe, than just stop looking at porn. (laughs) Okay, this is so much more meaningful than just someone saying, well, don't lose your temper this week. Okay, stop. Uh, Okay, stop drinking the alcohol if you're addicted to this. Stop. It's so much more meaningful than don't give in to your addiction to slander people. It's so much more meaningful, this text, than just saying, stop sleeping with your boyfriend. 
Okay, it takes the whole discussion and brings it to another level when you realize you have been loved so much and brought into the family. This God gave his own son that you might be brought into the family. Now live as an obedient child of a gracious father. So my friends today, my brothers and sisters in Christ, as obedient children, do not be conformed to the passions of your former ignorance. But as he who has called you is holy, you also be holy in all your conduct since it is written, you shall be holy for I am holy. So God, we thank you for this text. So often we approach this text in First Peter with a do this, don't do this mentality. But God, we thank you that as we study through this and we see it's set up in a very relational sense. We have a good and gracious father who has made us children of him. And so I pray, God, for every single one of my brothers and sisters in Christ here that we would walk, we would function as obedient children to a holy father, to you. My friends here today, as your heads are, as you're just in this last moments of prayer, meditation, talking with this God, this God who has desired this relationship with you and drawn you into this relationship with him, made you part of his family. Oh, my friend, would you this morning thank God that through faith he has brought you into his family? You didn't earn this holiness. Jesus earned your holiness. And because of that, my brother and sister in Christ sitting here today, would you pray that through this week you would make lifestyle choices that are in line with God's expectations. Be holy for I am holy. There are some here that are trying to put this together and I understand it. Oh friend, what we said to you a little bit ago about Jesus going to the cross to pay for your sins, that's real. You were born into this broken world with a serious problem, it's called sin. You can't deal with your own sin. In fact, it condemns you, this sin. Passed on from Adam. But oh my friend, God in his grace sent Jesus to the cross 2,000 years ago to give you new life. To pay for your sin. To pay for that death. Jesus rose from the dead to give victory over sin and death and to provide for you new life. Scripture says, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be rescued. Oh friend, have you ever placed your faith and trust in Jesus Christ? If not, would today be that day? Would you call on Jesus to save you? Some of you may need to go home get on your knees beside your bed or your sofa and talk with God. You might need to open the scriptures and read more of this, but don't, oh my friend, do not ignore this call. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you'll be saved. There'll be some after we're done with this service that would love to talk to you more about that. I certainly would. Don't ignore this, my friend. So our Father, we want to thank you for the time we could spend in your holy word today. Thank you for how appropriate it is. Thank you for the depths of its words, reaches into the breaths of our lives. I pray, God, that you'd please help us to walk in newness of life this week, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen.